Hello everybody and welcome to Chaotic Neutral Games. Today's uh, Tuesday slot is normally going to be reserved for Blades in the Dark, but unfortunately due to a couple of players and DM not being able to be here tonight, uh, we're going to be doing this one shot as a space holder. Thankfully, we had the lovely Mike come forward to be our DM for today, as uh, he has done a number of D uh, games in the past using his I think his system of choice he can correct me in a second uh, Cortex Prime now it's been a while since I've played with Cortex Prime I think it's been a while or not at all since Kat has played uh, but we're going to be playing in the world of Zadia by playing some of the uh, characters for the Dragon Prince RPG uh, Tales of Zadia that uh, has recently been promoted and has been promoted with Cortex Prime so very exciting I have to confess, I've only crammed the uh, Dragon Prince in the last few days, so I have an idea of the world, love the world, um, and uh, we'll see how it goes on. So we're just going to uh, chill out for the night and play with Cortex Prime and uh, Tales of Zadia. We're going to hand over now and meet the other two players, so uh, let's go to them. Thank you very much, Mike. Off you go. <laughs> yeah, no, it's great. It's great to uh, have you. Thanks for the opportunity to give this game a shot. Um, this is my second attempt at running this scenario, so let's uh, see how that goes. Um, just like camera slightly. Okay, then, guys. So we have um, Cat playing Binetta and uh, Sai playing Babacar. They're a pair of siblings, uh, some Fire Elves, that um, have... All right. We're going to avoid spoilers. Not that these characters have appeared in the show, but there's uh, this is set shortly after season three. Um, I'm aware that at least one of no, in fact, both of our players have yet to reach that point in the series. Yeah, um, and uh, I don't want to ruin it in case there's anybody watching from outside um, that has yet to see that. So we'll go with uh, we'll go with um, uh, guys. There is a handout on the um, on the. Roll 20, which well, I can read that if you wish, or you can have a quick look through. Um, I would I would suggest you read it out for anybody who's watching. Sure. Yeah. Okay, so I'll ask, there's one line of uh, spoiler in there which I'll skip over, so if it feels a little disjointed at the start, bear with me. Okay, after counting yourselves lucky not to have suffered an ill fate to big blank out, uh, a mysterious tone-delving moon shadow elf named Feathershaw, they, them, has commissioned your ragtag crew to investigate an abandoned city floating high across the Zadian sky. The island is on a collision course with a mountain range at the border, and the clock is ticking to salvage a rare artifact from it. You don't have time to do your own research before you leave, so hopefully Feathershaw has everything in hand. The city is called Aeneon, a name that has escaped everyday conversation in Zadia for a long time. You're hunting a powerful artifact called the Primal Well, which conducts sky and earth magics through itself. It's a chest-sized chunk of marble, faceted like a diamond, reverberating with the residual magic it collects from the air and from the rocks around it. This is then redirected downwards, pushing the city itself to great heights in the sky. It's the kind of piece that would perk up the ears, elven or otherwise, of any adventurer. Feathershaw tells you that by the time you make it to the mountains and the border, there'll be a 12 hour window to ride to Indian on a magic beam of moonlight and get in and out before the city is destroyed forever. Should be an easy job, they tell you. There's no bystanders that get the, there's no bystanders that risk getting hurt in an abandoned city. And Aeneon contains everything from baubles to lost legends. Feathershaw is obsessed with bringing this artifact back to the Moonshadow Elves as they claim their people's lives depend on it. So it sounds important. Your intense tour guide aside, it's now off to the mountains with you. What does lie ahead? Uh, you and the narrator can find out for yourselves by flying ahead straight into the Lost Oasis. Okay. Nice. So, um, Feathershawl is a Moonshadow Elf, um, going by they, them uh, pronouns, and has um, the incentive of getting the... Um, and the incentive of getting the uh, primal well um, 
there are a range of six characters available of which we've picked Babakar, a Sunfire Mage, and Benetta, a Sunfire Warrior. And they are going to be the two uh, player characters for tonight. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, do you guys follow the, the concept of your characters closely enough? Do you want to maybe give a little bit of an intro to your characters? Sure. Simon, you're on, on my screen now. Why don't you go first? <laughs> uh, I should have pointed that out. It's usually the DM who says uh, which player to uh, speak next. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, so I'm playing Babakar. I mean, other than having badass art, um, he seemed to jump out at me as being uh, a bit of a, 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 not a classical edgy character, but uh, uh, he's uh, Benetta's brother. Uh, Benetta is the uh, warrior of the two. Um, considers her to be the leader, and he's kind of the vizier, you know, he's kind of the advisor. Um, he is more to do with mind play, um, and yeah, he's a powerful battle mage, but he's also pretty much a spy master as well. He's not afraid to get his hands dirty, and um, he likes to psych out his enemies. Okay, so if we move over to Cat, Cat's playing Binetta. Um, yes, so Donetta is a um, Sunblade Elf uh, knight. Um, as Simon said, more more the leader of the two, um, although probably doesn't necessarily consider herself that way. It just seems to come naturally. Um, and yes, a very, very skilled fighter, although perhaps a little on the quick side to fight rather than take other solutions. Um, you, you both have um, traits that lead towards hot-headed behavior. Um, so it does sound like you've got a good grasp there. So I'm going to quickly go through the character sheet with you guys. Um, you have um, six attributes uh, set in the halo around your characters. Portrait, agility, awareness, influence, intellect, spirit, and strength. Um, you have six values as we scroll down on the left hand side. These are devotion, liberty, glory, mastery, justice, and truth. Each one of those has its own um, statement associated with it for your own character, which gives you a bit of an insight into how, how they play into those values. At the very bottom, we've got specialities. Um, so, for instance, Benetta has animal training, strategy, and sword play. You each have three distinctions. Uh, you're both Sunfire Elves, so you share the first distinction between you. Um, but Benetta, for instance, has Knight of Lux Aurea and Fickle Look as her further two distinctions. Between the three distinctions, you have two special abilities. Um, so again, I have Benetta open. So we have uh, Heat Being, being a Sunfire Elf, you can use your anger to step up your strength or agility in a test. And you also have Stalwart, which allows you to spend plot points to step down all of your stress dice, which allows you to recover faster uh, than others would be able to. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. So as we've now mentioned plot points, let me deal out to um, one of each to you guys. And we'll do that. So plot points can be spent during game to produce assets, to strengthen your dice balls so that you can produce better results. They can be spent to uh, activate abilities such as yours that allows you to uh, reduce stress. And there are other triggers as well. And we'll try and come across those in game rather than go through every rule right now. Um, so uh, that's plot points dealt out. There is also the uh, assets on your, on your character sheets. Each of you have a signature asset that is specific to your character. So you have a Sunforge blade. A lot of people point towards these basically being lightsabers made out of lava. Um, the, um, the one on Babakar's character sheet should be his spell list. Um, so you have basically the same mechanics there, but flavored to the, the role that you're playing. Um, each of these traits that I've listed has a dice attributed to it. So you'll see um, against your portrait, you've got eights, sixes, and tens. Within your values, there are four, eight, and, uh, four, eight six, and ten. I'm reading those in random orders. Uh, your distinctions and your assets each have a D8 associated with them. Uh, when you're putting together a dice ball to attempt something, uh, you'll take one dice from your attributes, one from your values, and one from your distinctions. 
and then add in any suitable or available assets for any suitable uh, specialties. You roll all those dice, then take the two best of those dice as your results. That will be to beat whatever difficulty has been set for the task. You'll take a third dice and that will be your effect dice. And the size of the dice is what is important, not the value on it. So if you've rolled uh, three dice and you kept two of them and you, you have a D10 remaining, then the D10 is the size of the effect that you're having. That will be used to either add stress, injuries, or other forms of uh, disadvantage to another character, or to create new assets that you can then use in further scenes to increase your chances of success later. Um, basically, that's the rules. Um, when we apply them, I'll expand, uh, expand on those and show you any specific openings that, that we need to talk about. Um, there are, uh, on screen, you'll see, you'll have seen them as players, there are two NPCs, Feathershaw, who we've already had a brief introduction to, and Norsix is the other one, and we will find him later. Uh, the, two, um, the two NPCs are called Catalyst uh, narrator characters in the system. Um, each has a Catalyst dice assigned to them, currently both at eight, so D8, and then they have values as well. And those values are the same ones that you're using on your character sheets. So you have those available to you so you can see the stats of those because as you interact with them and they succeed or fail, their values will change based on your actions. So you're going to be defining the importance of those characters as we progress into the game. Um, so there's that. Okay. Um, so with that brief introduction and the text read out before, um, you've got a general gist of what's going on, uh, but you may have some questions for further sure on the hike towards the mountains. Um, so we're just going to do a little bit of back and forth if you've got any further information you want to gather. And uh, if there are any ambiguities that you want to just check with me as a GM. And then once we're actually on site for further shores, uh, moon magic, we'll use that to try and fall to the island of Aeneon itself. Okay. And if we reverse and go to cat this time, do you have any questions or anything you'd like to begin with? Um, Simon, this is your opportunity to prep some ideas. So I'm not thrusting on you without prep time to think about it. So are you sure we're not going to run into anyone here? I mean, it, it seems like, you know, prime location for bounty hunters. I would have, I would have thought that, um, frankly, I'm surprised nobody's got there first. Sure, says um, Father Shaw. I, I understand that concern, but realistically, it's floating in the sky. We're way above any, any flight uh, that could get there. No creature that I'm aware of can fly that high. Um, so we're requiring moon magic to get to it. Um, now, I'm not saying I'm the only one that can cast this spell. So yes, certainly, there, are, there is a slim possibility. Somebody else could have uh, got a team up there. Uh, but the likelihood of anybody being there before is very slim. I mean, um, there's no record of anybody being in contact with this in centuries. Um, it's fallen off of the radar. The level of research I had to do to actually discover that, it, <clears throat> discover where it would be, the calculations I've done, the work that I've put into this, it's not going to put us in a situation where we're running into anybody. Um, this is as abandoned as I, I think anything could be. Um, um, <laughs> Well, yes, I, I, I don't think that's a serious concern. Thank you, that's good to know. I'm Simon. less concerned with people, Pabuka. I'm more concerned with the city itself. A city of that complexity surely has some form of defences, especially if, as you say, what we're going for has got some value to it. The defences will have been the guards, they're long gone. Uh, Really? Hmm. With that level but, of magic? But, but because, um, but because concerns are mirror some of my own, and that's why I need your help. I, I feel that ha with no defences at all, I could walk up there, find the, the uh, device, move away with the artifacts, and, and all would be fine. But yes, I, I do need additional uh, magical firepower. But because that's why I've brought you in on this. Also, there's the opportunity, maybe there are um, other forces that we need to um, fight our way through. So Benetta, your your sword will be of importance. 
I don't expect there to be anybody there, but who knows what uh, enchantments may be may may bring to life. Who knows? Um, my research is not to the finite level, so I want to be prepared for the unexpected. We're more than a blade and a cannon, Moonborn, but you'll find us good company on this trip. I assure you. And us. while your company will be, yeah, whilst your company will be appreciated, um, my my focus is to get this artifact back to my people. Um, That's what I meant. And We're more than fighters. Lives. We'll get it back. Thank you. Uh, your dedication to this uh, endeavor is is appreciated. And so it is. The the travel to the mountains is relatively eventless. Um, you have a little time if there is anything else you need to follow up on, but I believe that you reach the base of one of the mountains and as a speck in the sky above, um, you see the, the floating rock that is the city. Um, it seems quite distant, um, but it does appear that it is moving closer. Um, and yes, you suspect within a day at most, um, this, what must be a mighty edifice to be seen at this distance, will collide with the mountain peaks. Um, and who knows what damage that will do. Uh, Feathershaw begins one of the... Mm, Feathershaw begins the... Um, uh, preparations for the magic that will transport you to the rock and um, the purple swirls of energy that arc around him, uh, them that arc around them, um, start to uh, shake the pebbles and, and leaves that are around your feet uh, as you feel the lift pulling around you. He says, gather close. They say, gather close and we will uh, be away. And the cloak billows out around them and the light of the uh, crescent moon above pulls at you, the three of you, lifting each into an arc that spans across the distance. Um, the speed is breathtaking, um, and the view is unlike any you've seen before, uh, tinged by the purple magic as you fly through the sky. Um, the path that you flow brings you above the city for a brief moment and you have a, a shallow view into and through the walls of the city just as you come to an area outside of the main settlement landing in a small sort of cobbled patio almost uh, clearing um, there's a, a small settled area that has um, like a herb garden like maybe a vegetable garden um, uh, some bushes, um, there's um, paving slabs. Uh, the, the magic around Feathershore um, forms sort of a, a, a glowing bubble around you, illuminating the area in an eerie light. But it's early morning. Um, the sun is somewhere below the city itself, so long shadows are cast around you. But there is an energy to the air as you land. Um, the air is fresh, it's crisp. Um, it's a new day and new adventures await you. Take a look, so, sister. Simon. Take a look, sister. All these stories, these lives once lived, soon to be dashed into rubble, a scar on the countryside. They're long gone anyway. I don't see the difference to the mates. Maybe. Maybe. So, what's the direction? You're directing that to Feathershaw. Yeah. They seem um, distracted as they're reshaping the, the spell they, that brought you here and the light that's around them, pulling energies together and drawing new sigils in the air to push the light further away from them. Um, it's clear as the as the purple haze focuses around them and less on you, that whilst the light is dim, this is a well uh, presented and clear area, not overgrown, but kept. Um, they 
extend their arm out and their magic shifts from the dome around you into more of a, a river flowing out from their arms. It flows out towards the streets of the city. And then you see, as the focus on Feathershaw's face becomes not pained, but slightly surprised, um, their spell seems to be slipping out of their control. I'm going to step forward and start weaving a Circulus Luminous. Um, and, sure. Uh, tell, us what that, tell us what that is. Uh, Circulus Luminous is Ring of Light. Um, so I'm going to produce a barrier of light around me um, to light up the area. Um, sure. And basically I'm going to bolster Moon with Sun and uh, hopefully push back whatever's pushing on them. Okay, so you're um, assisting uh, yeah. Feather Shawl's spell. Yeah, okay. light is light. Um, so what we'll do there? Pushing on the light, I'm gonna I'm gonna try to bolster by putting my light out with hers. At this. Of course. Yeah. Okay, so if you want to um, hit your dice pool builder, mm -hmm. um, um, so the first thing it's going to ask you that um, this system is state it, uh, build it, um, roll it, and then uh, you know um, uh, detail the outcome. So can we? Um, what is it that you're hoping to achieve? I'm hoping that the uh, the light that I contribute to Feathershaw's light will push back on whatever it is that's putting pressure on them. Kind of just pushing yeah. out and either breaking it or getting it to stop pushing in and holding it together. I can see the, uh, the strain on their face and um, I'm going to be just there saying you're up against the sun and the moon. Avaunt, you know. Kind of okay, thing. right. Okay. Yeah, I, I like it. Very flavorful. Um, so if you um, if you're looking at that, then you're using uh, your your traits um, would probably stretch to um, you're either influencing or maybe calling on your spirits or either influencing their efforts. I take your inner spirit. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay. yeah I, I, this um, is not something that's. I'd say influence, influencing is more social. This is more, he's drawing something up from inside himself, kind of the sun burning inside and pushing. Okay. Yeah. Um, so uh, then of your values, I'm not going, I'm going to just suggest through for the first time, but I'm hoping that you'll get into the, the feel list. But if you've got a value in mind. Mm -hmm. uh, I would say it's mastery. It's, so not, it's, it's far yeah, from my so, highest, so, but I would say mastery would be it. Yeah. Sure. Yeah, yeah. no, entirely. Uh, alternatives might have been devotion or glory. Yeah. Um, um, I don't, he be... doesn't see this as particularly glorious at the moment. Um, yeah. He's trying to help somebody. Uh, he's currently being altruistic. Glory will come later. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I'd say this if is you more... were, If you were using this to investigate what was a cause of the thing, then it might have been truth. Mm -hmm. uh, if it was to uh, avenge maybe the failure or to, you know, to to uh, uh, try again and, and strengthen if it. If I maybe thought it was malicious, justice. I would just use justice. justice. Yeah. Okay. yeah. yeah. Um, so um, I'm trying to remember if your next should be distinction. So in this instance, it asks, are one of your distinctions beneficial or um, hindering? And I suspect Sunfire, Elf or Hot-Headed Sun Mage, both of which would be familiar. <laughs> Yeah, the, these are beneficial. Hot-headed sun mage, yeah. definitely. <laughs> I mean, you're specifically using you're specifically using magic to do this, so it's yeah. the mate, the sun mage trait. Um, I'm going to ask, don't don't actually launch the roll just yet, though. I'm just getting you to build your dice pool. Sure. Um, so ne next, you have your specialities, yes, and um, you have sun magic as a specialty at D8. Uh, specialty, yes, yes, I have a D8. Yeah. 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 And then the next one should be. Um, I can't remember off the top of my head if it asks for specifically it's for assets or for any other asks, dice or assets. But any other dice. Any. So your asset dice is a D8, which is your sun spell, uh, sun magic spells, and that includes the circular Lumus. Do not press send yet, yep. as I roll dice to set the difficulty for this. Now you're trying to strengthen the spell and give them more resolve. I'm going to. Um, I want to say that that's not actually going to be that difficult to help them. Um, so I will simply set the difficulty as I think I think I will no, I'll go as far as 2d8. I was going to go 2d6, but I'm going to go for 2d8 for this first roll. Okay, so when I hit this, um, 
it will show you that I've rolled a three and a uh, six. It's not going to sum those up for me because of the way that my roller does, um, but we can do that by ourselves. Nine. Your target number will be to beat a nine. Okay. So if you now activate yours. So, uh, yep, yeah, I've... Uh, I, I, sorry, I was just messing about with the thing, so I'm going to uh, roll mine. So that's a nine and submit. And, right, so looking at this, I've got uh, two eights, a five, a two, and a six. Yeah. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go for 14, but have the uh, D8 as the effect dice, if I may. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, you if you take the two eights to get you to 16... Mm -hmm. You've still got two d eights as your effect dice. Oh yeah, yeah. So I yeah, sorry, yeah. the six and the two are yeah. on d eights, weren't they? Yes. Yeah. yeah. But they're a little more sure. faint. Nice. Yeah, the ones that critted, you can see the outline. That's slightly slightly better. So yeah. So the ones <laughs> it's selected, the ones it's selected for, mm -hmm. are the the ones that get the highlights. Uh, but you've also got the greens on those because they have you're right critted. Yeah. Um, so the um, the outcome of that is that you have indeed successfully strengthened their efforts to cast that spell. It's not falling out of their control, and they. Uh, they're shrouded in that light that you produce. Um, the overall effect of that is that they're able to refocus their energies and tighten the spell, um, pulling in the, the fraying energies that were flying off to the sides, pushing it all into one solid beam. That beam then shoots with great force straight up the center of one of the um, open streets ahead of you and starts, you can see it weaving between buildings heading towards what looks like the larger building towards the center of town, what um, from here would be a keep or small castle. Um, and this registers with um, registers with Feather, Feather Shawl as um, a great success. Now, normally we would be looking at changing a catalyst dice or and one of the uh, values if you're in competition with them. But what you actually chose to do here was strengthen their efforts. So I'm going to rule the same thing here. So um, their mastery, which is what you were assisting with, yep. uh, will go up one, as will their catalyst dice. Nice. Uh, bringing their catalyst to D10 and their mastery to, do it to a D10. But one of the other values has to go down. And that's now in your hands. So pick devotion, liberty, glory, justice, or truth as the uh, value to go down. Glory can't go down any further. <laughs> um, oh, no, one of those. One of those. Sorry. Oh, oh one sorry. Of oh, sorry. I'm, I'm, looking, I'm looking at Norsex. Sorry. Um, uh, yes, in that case, glory. I stole a bit of the thunder, so their glory goes down. I like it. Yeah, that works for me. Uh, so we will step down to a D6 there, Glory. Um, so we now have D6 Glory, D10 Mastery, and a D10 in Catalyst. And this is the, the way that their relation to you will change. So they are very positively in favor of what you've just done. So they're enamored to that. Uh, Feather Shawl gives you a, a cursory nod and, uh, as, as gratitude as they focus one step further. Um, and then some of the light from your skull is pulled in to the glow around the moon magic. So now there's the yellow, fiery orange sun magic burning around it as a as a strengthening um, outer casing of that spell that shoots along those streets, um, glowing very brightly um, in, a, in a way that on, a, on their own, they could not have achieved. Um, and then you feel that pull as well. You feel your magic being drawn into not only Feathershaw spell, but some source at the far end has a has a strong hold, pulling your magic away from you. The two of you bolster and take uh, a strong stance, um, and then Feathershaw you can feel is preparing to let go of the spell. Checks with you, ready to release. Stop. The spell dissipates, and you feel it whipped away from you, um, pulled as if uh, a rag was torn from your hands uh, into the distance, the loose end of this spell flapping through the streets uh, as it rattles against the sides of uh, the buildings. Everything all right? You... I'm no magic expert, but that didn't look good. What do you think? 
I'm not saying this, uh, to Benetta. I'm saying to Feth uh, uh, Feathershall. What do you think? Yes, that was yes, that was interesting. Um, something at the other end, and I suspect it's the primal well, is hungry for whatever magic he can get. And as that word leaves his mouth, the island reacts to the dissipation of that last part of the magic, tilts probably about 10 degrees away from you, and doesn't right itself. I, uh, I don't suppose your research happened to show what was holding us in the air right now? That, that is the primal world that we're here to take. As you feel that tilt and readjust your balance, you hear in the distance the cries of people's surprise and doors opening and people flooding into streets in the distance. And at your feet, something rustles in one of the bushes. Cat, how does Benetta react? Um, initially, I'm stepping out away from the bush and drawing my blade to make sure it's nothing dangerous. Now, yeah. I don't know that you'll see this on the stream. This emerges from the bushes. A small, plumed chicken, which looks up at you impossibly through the plumage over its eyes, um, opens its beak, closes it's its so beak, fluffy. and clucks. What? So, ah, excellent, it's on screen. <laughs> so no one survived then. Fantastic. Fantastic. You know, people could have lived off that. I'm just trying to pet the bird. It, it, it seems very interested in, in your <laughs> attentions um, and, and sort of uh, snuggles up to you and then it's um, little um, little claws start to crawl up um, your leg and try to take a uh, position somewhere towards your shoulder. Uh, are, are you allowing this chicken to use you as its next nest? I'm I'm going to like gingerly peel it off my leg because I'm assuming the claws are quite sharp and put it up on my shoulder. Oh, wow, you're assisting. And then, then it, yeah. it's certainly very comfortable up there and, it, um, and takes takes a comfortable moment and then shuffles in and takes a uh, look around at its new uh, new vantage point, clearly liking it, uh, and you've now got a chicken on your shoulder. I, um, I give my sister a rock-like eyebrow raise, um, <laughs> but don't comment. <laughs> the... The outcome of that is that you've now got a, a chicken friend. Now, um, if you wish to turn uh, the chicken into some sort of asset, we don't have to do that this minute, but should you want to use it as an asset, Damn it, uh, paying, a plot point, uh, paying a plot point will provide you with a D6 asset of chicken friend. Now, why you would want that, I don't know, but it's here in the system. Get a chicken um, nice. Maybe think of, yeah. So <laughs> you don't need to do that until you need to do that. Um, if something is important, you get it... Um, you get a, you put a dice in it. And if it's not narratively important, we don't need to give it a dice, basically. Um, so um, the noise in the distance uh, is growing. There, there appear to be multiple voices on the streets ahead of you. Uh, and some saw the glow of magic as it passed the windows and are heading in your direction to find out what caused that. These people even know they're plummeting to their deaths. Maybe they don't have magic. Maybe they're stuck up here. I, I turn to uh, further show. Abandon, Nana. Who's going to talk to them? I, I thought it was well, abandoned. Look at me. I certainly don't have time to deal with crowds of um, natives. You're the marshal. Who 
cr crowds of I thought we were saving an ancient artifact that was about to be destroyed, but instead there are people here. Further short, just how, leave many, them. how many people could you get down? With with my cloak, maybe 10, 20 if I pushed. I mean, uh, uh, repeated trips. I don't have time for that. With, with the primal well, we could do so much more. It has the magic to do that, though. It has, it has earth and sky magic. Add that to my moon magic. We could use, we could use the combined power. We must get to the there. primal well. Let's get there then. Um, and yeah, I'll uh, I'll start pressing forward brashly. Yeah, I'll sheathe my blade and take off running after my brother. Yeah. Sorry, you had your blade out sort of in preparation for the, the chicken. Are you saying you're putting it away or keeping it out? I'm, I'm putting it away. This is what the chicken right. wants you to do. <laughs> the chicken lured you into a false sense of security. It's so cute. Uh, it couldn't possibly mean us any harm. No, not at all. Um, no, the, two things the, in role-playing yeah. games never do. <laughs> yeah, no. um, the the group that is approaching you from the streets um, seems to be led by uh, a sky uh, skywing elf in ceremonial armor. Um, there are a number sort of pushing him along ahead of them almost. Um, he has been volunteered as their spokesperson. And seeing you as a martial um, form of uh, possible antagonist, they approach you with a club uh, drawn and held out gingerly ahead of them. And um, You might want to put that away, the, friend. You wouldn't want to hurt anybody with that now, would you? I, I, I say, in, in, in the name of Indian, stand down and announce your intentions. Sister. Brother. Go ahead. What are our intentions? I'm facing down the guy who's pointing a club at my sister. We need to warn you. You're, do you realize you're on a collision course? Your, your entire city is on a collision course. Um, a young, a young woman um, behind him called out. I have warned you. I said, I said I saw that coming, and and the god kind of waves behind him to try and quiet the crowds. Now we'll have none of that alarmist talk. Now, why are you here? Why did the island suddenly tilt? What was that glow in the streets? I just turned to look at the other two, <laughs> raise one eyebrow. We're coming here because the city is going to crash into the ground and be destroyed into lots of little bits and you with it if we're not able to help. There's an artifact here that's going to be able to help us to help you. Get in our way and we'll leave in a glow and we'll pick up the pieces of your broken bodies later on. However, help us. What my brother means to say is that we are at your service and we come bearing no ill intentions. We just want to make sure that you're all right. I like the, the way I said it best. <laughs> the children in amongst the crowd uh, generally cower at some of the things that um, Babakar has said. But your kind words have definitely put, put the interest of one little girl who sneaks a little bit further forward and a little further forward still, um, looking more more fearless than timid. Um, and um, her voice sort of pipes up. Oh, you found Wiki. 
And she points to the chicken on your shoulder. I sort of, if Wiggy likes them, they can't be all that bad. I just sort of gently offer oh, him oh, chicken. No, I mean, you're trying, but Wiggy, Wiggy's set. She's, she's not oh, moving. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> yes. Distinguished <clears throat> guard, knight of the sun elves. That's me. <clears throat> the chicken on the shoulder. With a chicken on your shoulder. Um, the uh, the young girl introduces herself as Pareka. Uh, Wiggy and me, we go way back. Um, I, I mean, this child's probably four. <laughs> <laughs> um, and again if if she likes you then you must be really nice and very tall you're not like us though are you are you from are you from down there Yeah, that's what we've been trying to tell those lot. They're not oh, really listening to ne us. Necrex is, um, he's, uh, he's okay. Just give him a chance. He's all right. Um, and, I mean, everybody else is just like, <laughs> yeah. will he do? Will he do? Um, you notice whilst, whilst you're interacting with the, the young girl and the, and the guard, that Feathershaw's um, approached one of the older looking um, sky, sky elves, sky wing elves, um, and they're entering into some sort of discussion. The crowd are uh, fractured, their attentions are all over the place. Some are nagging Necrix, the guard, to try and do some positive action, take, take charge of the situation. Others are crowding around this elder um, that Feather Shawl's approaching. The majority are just reeling from the chaos of the city's changing um, pitch and calling out, what, what will we do? What, what, what is happening to, to the island? Um, are, you, are you here to save us? The young lady that had said before, I said before that she'd seen the um, fall of the island coming, um, steps forward and starts uh, prophesying doom, uh, destruction, um, and uh, the overall Excuse me. Uh, Excuse outlook me. Is, is, is gray. Uh, gee, gee. Ah! We're trying to keep people... <sighs> Shut up. We're trying to keep people calm here. Do you, do you think you could maybe prophesy your doom a bit more quietly. Um, the the young the young lady that you're uh, interacting with. Uh, if you are going to help, do something. We have so little time now. Do, do you have any advice? I mean. I just kind of look around at the chaos. These people need a strong leader. She looks at Necrex with disdain in her eyes. Um, and then over to the uh, bickering feather shawl and, and her um, elder. We need somebody with some authority and a plan. Can you be that? I'm not going to say anything because I'm going to wait for my sister to say it, but there will be a smile and a nod as she's saying that. It's just kind of approving what she's saying. I sort of turn to my brother and uh, raise one eyebrow at his nod. We can't just come into this situation. We know nothing about these people. I don't really think it's appropriate. The young, the young female elf looks at you and says, you know one thing. You know this island is 
doomed and we will all be dead if no plan is put in place. The city leadership has never taken my prophecy seriously. And you say you're here because you know we will fall, that the city is doomed. We're sunborn, sister. Come on. It's for us to lead. You've asked me to be quiet. You've asked me to not doomsay so loudly. Think of the frustration I have faced. I've known this for months and no action has been taken. Today, the island tilts and everything moves faster. And you admit, you can feel, although there was wind, high winds when you first got here, it seems that the wind is swifter. She wants to speak the truth. Let her. Yes, of course. Should we find the artifact then? You prime your people. Tell them that we are here and we agree. Do you, if you need us to tell them now before we leave, we'll do so before we leave. But then we must leave. Then I will begin to rally those who are concerned, like minds that I know. Can I count on one of, count on one of you to assist? Of course. And this I'm is where, afraid. as a GM, I'm going to... This is where I'm going to step in as a GM and point out this scenario is not designed for party cohesion. This scenario is designed that there are multiple paths to follow. And if you ignore some of them, things will be harder, not easier by staying together. I am advocating splitting the party. Admittedly, with only two of you, you're going to struggle to cover all the ground. Let's (laughs) see what we can get done. Um, it will, it will make it more intriguing, not less, because you will have definitely some plot lines will not be as, as clear. Um, so let's see where that takes us. Babakar is willing, but he knows that even though he doesn't care, well, it's not that he doesn't care, he cares about the truth. Um, he gives it unadorned. Um, he knows that it doesn't always have the best effect. Um Besides, you're a mage. You need to find the artifact. I won't be able to do anything with it. Will you be all right alone? And you can see that's a bit of brother coming out. When have I ever not been? Other than the time when I got in a fight with it. When have I ever not been? Well, I was going to mention that time, but if we're not going to be talking about that. <laughs> okay, so with... Um... With Benetta turning from that moment's confrontation with her brother to the elves that you that you've been talking to, so I, I realise I've not actually given a, a name to the um, the Skywing mage you were just talking to. Uh, Sifterus is the name of the female elf that you spoke to. The child was Pereka. The um, young woman is Sifterus. Um, she has called over a, a few others. I'm not going to give you a a raft of names right now. Um, but if we need to pull out specific characters as, as this progresses, we will. Um, you need to try to win their trust um, and a little authority maybe, Kat, if we can get Benetta to um, consider how you're going to inspire um, their trust. Um, so if you want to start pulling a, a dice pull together for that, I'll roll some... Uh, The difficulty target for that will be... uh, So, uh, not the greatest of rolls, um, but actually better than the last one I did. So, uh, 10, uh, 2 and an 8. I'll keep the 2 on the D8 as an effect if I need it. I doubt I will. Um, So, you're looking to uh, build trust with the crowd of Skywing Elves. Do you want to talk us through your um, trait choices? Sorry, I'm I'm struggling with a bit a bit with the interface. Give me a second. Sorry, sure. So I'm trying to build trust, and I'm going to use. I think I'm going to use awareness because I'm trying to read the room and kind of figure out. Um, 
I see that. What what approach is going to work? Um, and I'll try that for justice, just because. Um, you yeah, know, you understand will, yeah, I, I, mean I feel that. Yeah. Die. yeah. Um, and how do my distinctions matter? Uh, so in general, um, and we can focus on this now. So the uh, distinctions you have, you may have one that feeds into this and supports what you're trying to do. Um, and in which case you would go for the beneficial. But you also have, if you notice underneath the three distinctions, you have an, an additional ability called hinder. Um, if you think any of your distinctions would actually be a negative influence in this scenario, you can, instead of rolling the D8, swap it out for D4. And that action will earn you a plot point. So your role playing into something that is a bit of a weakness gets you a reward to use for extra effect later. Okay. Um, well, I think the fact that I'm a Sunfire Elf and potentially a bit hot-headed would probably act against me. But on the other sure. hand, I also have this bird, which I'm going well, to call that, assets. Yeah. Cool. So you can pay, you can spend a, a, a plot point now to get a D6 asset out of the uh, out of the chicken because clearly if wiggy likes you you can't be all bad yeah talking about the chicken so what does this mean do your specialties apply uh so you take a look at the specialties on your character sheet. Oh, um, okay this is a bit of a stretch can i use um my animal training specialty <laughs> certainly can combo it's with the chicken. Come in handy to make that yeah i like that Okay, and then I add a d6 for the chicken. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's worked well. Okay. Um, so uh, you've rolled awareness and justice. Your distinction at d4, so I'm going to deal you off an um, extra plot point. Um, so you should now have two. Oh, but then you've spent one of those to create the d6 chicken. So if you can play one of those to the, the tabletop and then delete it, thank you. Um, your speciality of animal training came in handy and the other dice that you had was the chicken itself. You've rolled a four and an eight as your result, uh, giving you a 12. And you have um, a four or a six as your uh, four, uh, sorry, a four or a dark D6 uh, for either of your dice there can be your effect um there's so you're trying to be a 10 you've got a 12 yeah okay so um your effect dice would be the d6 so you gain an asset uh additional asset on top of the chicken of the crowd's trust so if you want, in, in your character sheet, there's a text box for assets at the bottom, um, and they just list what's in your um, D8 asset. But at the bottom, that just add in uh, Wiki, the chicken, D6, and Crowd's Trust, D6. And how do I mark um, off that plot point? Uh, so you, uh, sorry, over your character icon, uh, where your name is, uh, sorry, over your name on the, um, uh, on the screen, you've now got two plot points cards in your hand yes no sorry i don't see it okay okay so uh in the roll 20 interface at the bottom of the screen you'll see uh i'm the narrator you should see your name and size name hovering ah, above yeah, yeah, that yeah, got it. yeah cool um so there we are excellent thank you and the one that you just played for the desktop we can just highlight that and then delete we get to there first Gone. Right. Um, so, and they just go back into the deck then. Uh, okay. So, you've managed to create um, two assets there in one turn, both of which you'll be able to call on in future dice pools if you need to add those in. Um, if, you, if you want to now give us a little bit of um, either the spiel that you gave them or how did you build that trust amongst them? Um, I'm just going to crouch down next to the little girl and let her pet the bird and show off how much he likes me and then show off how much the little girl likes me um and just as as people begin to like gather around just kind of chat with them um 
I don't know. I'm not going to bring up the end of the world just now. I'm just trying to build a bit of a rapport. Mm -hmm. um, be friendly with them. Sure. Um, there's still a lot of questions being fired around, and what you've done hasn't necessarily answered all of them. Um, so we'll continue that shortly. Um, but um, you're introduced to a, a, a few faces, names are thrown at you very quickly, um, but a couple of, of others who are proactive and already have suggestions for how this could maybe move forward. Um, but all we'll do is we'll come back to that in a moment. So Simon, uh, Whilst that's been going on, you've had your eye on Feather Shawl and this elder Skywing elf, um, and their conversation is getting rather heated. Do you wish to be closer and hear what they're saying? Uh, yeah, barefacedly. I'm not even sidling up. I'm just walking up. Right, you're basically just like injecting yourself into their conversation. Yeah, not standing between them, but just standing like right next to both of them yeah. and listening. Yeah. Um, so the, um, the conversation's been going on for a while and you're coming in midway, but, uh, Feather Shawl's, um, saying, please, old man, take me to the primal well immediately. I'm, I'm your only hope of leaving here alive. I have my own people to save as well. Come on, let's go. Very em emphatically and enthusiastically. Whereas the old man slows down. Old man, listen here. I'm no uneducated fool and I'm not scared of you. I have my own magic. With an opening line like that, I certainly won't help you, and your magical mystery cape can fly off. The most precious I'd have had in my home. Never. The conflict continues as you're approaching. You're hearing this, this continuing. Um, I will generally avoid, when, when jamming, I will generally avoid NPC to NPC conversations as much <laughs> as possible. Uh, so the rest of the conversation that's going on is very um, heated. Um, the um, uh, the old man, I'm going to give his name as, as you can tell it's already on screen anyway. Norsex is um, uh, just growing in frustration, but that frustration is shared by Feather Shaw. Um, and uh, the, the energy in Feather Shaw is evident. They are looking to break away from this conversation then and make their own way towards the keep. Um, and Norsex uh, is being uh, impeded somewhat by the people around him. Um, as you've been approaching, the, uh, the guard has been yammering in your ear about something that you're basically just bored of listening to. Uh, yeah, I blocked him out long ago. I wait for Norsex to burn himself out a bit and when he's kind of trying to trying to grab a new angle to complain about i go you said you've got magic old man enough to make all of this all these lovely people here float to the ground unharmed should the need arise oh good thank you some some sense being spoken um he turns uh, and then the, the guard explains, yes, this is my prisoner, um, uh, uh, this and the other uh, foreign elf, uh, Norsex, uh, um, and uh, the uh, elder Sky, Skywing elf is just um, underwhelmed, but turns to you and says, thank you. Um, and, and that distraction enough is enough for Feathershaw to kind of slip around the back and start walking away. Um, Norsex implores you, please, Come to my home. Let us sit and eat and discuss. And we will chase down the truth of this um, plan for success. You didn't answer my question, friend. When you all, realize, all in good time. When you Please, realize, step away friend, from the street and the that crowds. this city is about to turn into a scar upon the landscape, when you realize that, do you have the magic to get your people safely to the ground. Please, let us step inside. We will discuss this in full. I, I've just made a new pot of stew. And I've Join et, me at my table. And I've had only recently, your hospitality is very welcoming, but I can't help but feel that your, your need to procrastinate here either shows foolishness that you're not willing to step forward for your people or that you're complicit in not listening to her words. And I point to the soothsayer. And I'm being dominant. I'm not backing down. I'm being reasonable, but being dominant. If you just 
if you're just going to bully this lot, their pride, which is already evident and prickly, um, I'm trying to give him the chance to come out of this looking wise. Okay. Um, so before I, I we, go harder. Right. We've got so far. We've had a test here. Um, each of you have, have rolled against general difficulty, but you've not exactly been challenged by another character. So what we're going to do now is enter into what's called a challenge in the system. It's, there's some notes at the bottom of the screen on that. Basically, we'll put together a, a dice pool each for the NPC and for yourself. Mm -hmm. um, and then you'll set the difficulty this time. You're trying to convince Norsex to break away from their ideal. Of, Let's go somewhere that we can talk in private. Uh, he witters on a little bit about that. If you win the challenge, then it goes your way. If he wins the challenge, then he's convinced you to go his way. Yep. Um, the way the challenge works, it's a back and forth. You'll set the difficulty, I'll try to beat it. You have the option to then try and beat it again. And we will continue to do that until one of us either fails to beat it or opts not to try. Right. Both of those are a loss instance. Dealt with slightly differently, mm -hmm. but that's the way that we go through with that. Sure, okay. Uh, let's... So if you want to set the difficulty for that first, so I roll first, yeah? Yeah, so you're pulling your dice pool together to convince them that they should stop. I think you said procrastinating. Uh, that yeah, might be I've, the, I've, the I've written down convince them to act, but yeah, same thing. Um, yeah. I This is an influence. It's not my best. Um, uh, yeah, I am trying out of truth, um, just barefacedly piercing through to the essence of the situation. Uh, how do my distinctions uh, matter? Well, uh, I'm going to have to play the hot-headed sun mage again. Um, mm -hmm. I'm an authority. Um, yeah, uh, I think I think that seems that either that seems simplicity sound is the best solution. Either way, both uh, there's there's a d8. Yeah, I think. Yeah. Yeah, I think I think that's right. I think that's right. Uh, do my special specialities apply? None in this case. Because neither crafting nor sun magic for this, um, yeah, no. and then uh, I don't the, think your assets will either. Yeah, I mean, I was going to ask what does sense truth of the heart? I guess it's detect lies. Oh. Um, yeah, I mean, I mean, I am if, trying if, to. It feels, it feels like that would be a strange way to start this. That, I that's might not bring quite it in what later. you were aiming If for. I suspect that yeah. he is an agent saboteur, I might bring it in, but I won't. For now. So that's that's why it's a back and forth. The dice pool might change after the first round. Okay. Uh, oh, I've just rolled. So, uh, you're setting the difficulty, so yep. acting first is right. Uh, so that's just an eight, I'm afraid. Well, it's a good start, because then I might be able to beat it. Um, so... Uh, okay, so I'm putting my uh, pull together. So I bring in my catalyst dice. Um, and I think my value is going to be truth as they're looking to tell you something, but just not everybody. Uh, and then their distinctions. Oh yeah. They've got a beneficial distinction that comes into play here. Um, they'll play Operate the stewardship. Yeah. They're going to play the stewardship, um, uh, speciality. But I don't think they have anything else to add to the dice pool. Um, and so we have a... Ah, we have our first one. I'll come to that in a moment. Um, so the five and the six uh, give me an 11. So I've beaten your total by yeah. three. Um, my, your current uh, effect dice was a D8. Mine is a D8. We'll, we'll keep track of that as it goes on. Yeah. Whatever your latest dice roll gives you a, um, effect dice. Yeah. Um, the one. So in the in this system, when you roll ones, uh, they're called hitches. When when I do them, they have an additional title called opportunities because that triggers some things. But I don't think it's going to come up in this game. But the ones can be activated by paying a plot point. So I would either pay you one and you gain a plot point, um, and that allows me to give you stress, or you can spend a plot point to reduce stress. Now at the minute, I don't think you have any stress. No, I don't. Um, so, um, but one of your um, distinction abilities does give you stress to increase your agility or strength, yeah. for instance. So you could be giving yourself stress dice based on that. Um, 
Uh, so at this point, I don't think there's anything you can use with that. But I've managed to raise the difficulty here from eight to 11. Now, you have the opportunity in your response to uh, try and beat that. So enter into another dice roll or to back out now. If you back out now, you benefit by gaining a plot point for taking a defeat through your own option. Uh, you won't get that plot point if you don't back out. If you fail, you'll just suffer consequences. Whichever one of us fails, will be getting that effect dice in stress. Um, and either way, success or failure, Norsic's catalyst and his um, uh, value will change up or down depending on who wins. So okay. if you lose, stress. If you give in, stress and the plot point. Um, I'm going to persist because sure. I'm hot-headed. Um, also, part of what he's trying to divine is that he's presented the very scary truth to this guy. Um, yet the guy is still persisting. Now, uh, he's intelligent enough to know that there could be something here. There could be a reason that he's aware of that even the impending crashing of your city into the ground still means that he wants to take me to one side and explain the complexity or something along those lines. Or he could be trying to get me to get out of the public eye so he can shank me. Who knows? Um, either way, it'll turn out badly for him if he tries anything bad. But I'm going to persist. I This is almost that I'm switching to convincing him to divining the, the, the truth of the situation here. He's convinced mm -hmm. me enough because he he won yeah um he's convinced me enough that there sh there may be a reason to go with him but i want to persist to kind of assure myself that there's definitely a reason and that's the point where yeah i am going to use that spell um so okay. i i would like to do a test to um divine the truth of his words sure. So this is a continuing this is a continuing contest. Yeah. So to get that effect, you've got to win the contest. Yeah. So you need to add that into your dice pool mm -hmm. on this one. Um, so you're looking to beat my eleven. Um, okay. I noticed that I've rolled it as a feather short. Please ignore that. It is it is no six. Um, but yeah, if you want to pull your dice pool together, uh, same again. You're trying to convince them, or or maybe this time it's discern um, why he's so. Evasive. I've just said, yeah, divine whether I should join him. Uh, this time I'm going to go with my intellect because I'm hot headed, but I'm also observant, tactical. Yeah. Um, I'm still going to go with truth in this case because um, that's what I'm trying to find. Uh, my distinctions in this case uh, don't matter, I'm going to say. None of the three things here. Not the hot-headed sun mage, not simplicity is the best solution because I'm going into complexity, not being a sunfire elf. They don't matter. Uh, they don't go ahead, uh, go against me, I'd say, either. Um, do my specialities apply? No. Um, but I will be using um, uh, Verum Animo, uh, a sense truth of the heart. Um, and so I'm calling on... I guess, sun magic to illuminate the situation. Let's see how I okay. do. Um, uh, that's all good, it. but you have rolled a one. I have rolled um, one and I have failed. Your distinctions didn't help. You were casting sun magic. Oh yeah, I should have a d6. Do you want to throw in a d8 as well? Uh, throw in a d8, just, yeah. just roll a single d8 now. Yeah, yeah. I forgot I had sun magic as that as well. Oh, darling. And That's your speciality so is sun magic, so you also have that as a device <laughs> as well, no? Um, thank you very much, Scumfuse, for your five-month subscription. And welcome. We haven't seen you in a while. Um, so, uh, let's see. Uh, D... So it's two more D8s. Oh, two more D8s. Nice. Uh, because your sun magic also counts. So that wasn't a good start. <laughs> Let's okay. see. Oh, one and a three. Yeah. Okay. That. Yeah. 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 That, that didn't help. I'm up to yeah. eleven exactly, but that didn't help. Okay. Um. So, um, when you roll hitches, I pay you a plot point and give you stress. I believe the stress always comes in at d six, and then 
steps up for each additional one you've rolled. So I'm giving you a D, oh wow, okay, giving you a D8 stress here. Uh, bear with me a second, let's have a look. So the stresses in this game are afraid, angry, corrupted, which is specifically in reference to dark magic, and we're not doing that today, so probably not going to use that one. So afraid, angry, exhausted, injured, or insecure. Um, knowing that you are hot-headed, I am very tempted to kick in your angry stress. So it would start at D6, and I'm going to step that up to yep. D8. So I'm good for that. Six, eight. So if you look at your character sheet now, you'll see that a, a new box has opened up on there. Oh, uh, I am angry sheet. at eight. Yep. Yes. Um, so in future, when I'm rolling dice against you, I will check what stresses you have, and I can add in that angry stress in my dice pool to punish the fact that you know you are angry. So if you're trying to be diplomatic, for instance, which I think your next roll might be, mm -hmm. then that will come in against you. So let's looking at your results. So the current target is eleven. Uh, you've rolled an eight, and the three is your next best dice. That gets you to the eleven. Um, and I need to give you a plot point, don't I? So one second. So, so you have an extra plot point. Um, so if you want to use a plot point, you can buy an extra dice from your um, uh, available dice to add into your result. So oh. currently you're at 11. That is a draw, and draws go in the favor of the players. So you could just leave it at 11. Or you can make it more difficult for them to beat by adding the two that's on the other uh, D8 you have. I'm going to do that. I'm going to take it okay. to 13. I, he really I will, wants to for, know what's going on here. Yeah, Yeah, of course. So um, the outcome there is that that's used all of your available dice in your result. So you don't have an effect dice left. Oh. We may be losing cat if their internet is struggling so let's just see how that's going um cat if you need to drop your video would that still work i guess we'd lose the voice then and then streaming would be a little it, bit less. it seems to be all right for now i'm just letting you know in a okay minute. okay sorry thank you um so you're using all of your dice in your result which leaves you no effect dice but the game doesn't leave you effectless you are given a 3d4 effect okay uh, which which you will carry into uh, your results uh, into your effect if um, this is the end of the world. So let's have a look at this. Uh, you've spent the pot point, yep. drag that onto the, um, to the table and Which delete it. Which brings it, it to um, 13, so here's how uh, Yes, yeah. Uh, so Norsex is very committed to trying to um, spend a moment with you alone and explain what's going on. So I think we're going to go one more time around and try and beat your 13. Um, and uh, still his catalyst is at D8. He's going to, again, lead with truth. It's the value that he is leaning into. His distinction is beneficial. And he has the magic you've used against him, you, you would, you're going to need to sort of explain that when it comes around to the narrative part of this, how you wove that in without it being in his face or something, or maybe it was in his face. You know, like, I, know. I would say um, a truth he, detection spell is probably pretty covert. Um, maybe as I was facing him down, my eyes glowed slightly. Uh, so it'd have a certain Zephyr effect, but it, it, it wasn't super showy. Okay. Um, I'm going to add in your anger as well so that's an extra d8 on my roll which is the reason i thought i'd keep going he sees that your um frust your frustrations are showing and he's going to try and use that as a please please calm come inside away from the crowd and like that, you know, that kind of approach uh and i have also rolled one so remembering you can spend a plot point of which you've still got two so you you should have dragged one of those to the desktop and deleted it yeah. um I don't uh so you can do that now to step down your stress if you wish. Um, I've rolled a one. You can buy that opportunity with a plot point. I've um, rolled a thirteen. Yeah, I'm going to do, do this. I'm going to get rid of my stress as well. Yeah. Sure. Okay. Um, I'm going to 
Now, I've got the 13, but I've also got two extra D8s, both of which have rolled a three. So I'm going to spend a plot point. Um, I don't have six, so I'm going to get rid of some of these. Um, I have two per... I have one per uh, player, I believe. So um, I'll get rid of all of that. Right, um, and I will use one now to keep a three. Okay. Um, so my total is now 16. Uh, I, ha I still have a D8 effect dice available. Your last effect was a D4. I'm feeling pretty confident about that. Um, uh, so I'm passing back to you. He, he's taken hold of your arm in a calming move to try and convince you that what we need to do is, is maybe sit down together. This is far too heated. Please, sir. I can see that I'm having an effect of calming you down already. Come with me. Let us sit. Let us eat. Let us discuss. There is a clear path and there are things you must know. Time is of the essence. Lead on. You're giving in there. Giving in. Okay, so I'm going to give you um, a plot point back because uh, you uh, gave in. Um, and that's coming at you now. And the stress that I'm going to give you. Um, I already paid to get rid of my anger stress. So, yeah, your anger stress is at eight, and you've set that down by spending that plot point. So it's now a d6. Yep. Okay. Um, I am going to give you a d6 in insecure uh, as you are giving in, but you're very consciously aware of the fact that time is, is yeah. on your heels. Yeah, he's nervous. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Not that he'd ever admit to it. Um, yeah. I'm going to say that uh, it's probably a good time here to take a 10 minute break. Uh, normally sure. we Thank do it at half that. nine, but that's when we start at eight. We started at seven. So um, we're going to take a quick uh, 10 minute break. Um, however, we will uh, leave you guys uh, who are watching with uh, the uh, some of the sounds of Epidemic Sounds. I don't know if you uh, have used this music service before, but it allows us to have uh, royalty-free music on the show. And um, we've been using it a lot more uh, recently. And I must admit, I've been using it as much as my uh, uh, my music account, my Spotify account. So uh, um, by all means, listen to a few of the uh, uh, bits and we will be right back in about 10 minutes. See you then.
and welcome back everybody when we left off we uh were trying to convince a bunch of people uh to allow us to save them uh from crashing into the ground <laughs> um uh, just to reiterate a big thank you for uh both scornfuse and earlier on this week uh we had he says quickly switching over uh minion uh, renewing their uh, subscription so five months for scornfuse and six months for minion um, thank you for continuing to support the show. Anyway, uh, Mike, back over to you. Sure, thanks. Um, so we we had uh, Simon and Norsix, sorry, uh, Babacar and uh, Norsix were um, debating on where the next part of the conversation should happen. And uh, Simon relented, letting uh, Babacar go and eat soup. So the pair of them will be retiring to uh, Norsex home. Uh, this will take you away from the crowd where uh, Benetta is going to be summoning up some sort of plan to save everybody. But at the same time, Feathershaw has slipped away. And where they are and what they're doing is now out of sight and um, not entirely out of mind, hopefully. So let's go try, let's try going back to Cats. Um, and we'll try out some of the ideas that they've been bringing forward to you um, as ways to get off of the island. Um, let me pull up a list of those suggestions, and I will let you know. Yes, here we are. So, um, one old lady who's convinced that you're some kind of ghosts sent to torment these poor people in the final hour of need um, uh, has a kind of crazy plan to take some of the foliage maybe some large fern leaves uh, imbue them with sky magic and use them as gliders to have people fly to the ground in safety um, that got some interest. Um, around the city's edge, there are gates, and some of them have intact um, drawbridges that could be lowered. Um, they would hopefully extend out over the mountain as you get close. Um, and if there were convenient ledges, people could rush from the, the outreaching bridge onto a cliff face, uh, cliff top. Let's not jump into cliff faces. Um, uh, or alternatively, just try to find um, the moment of impact and get people to leap off. The island is plummeting, but not at particularly high speeds. The, um, the primal well is controlling the descent, even if it has been pulled off its course. So um, it's possible as you get close, people could be on lookout and call out whereabouts would be safe to leap from and where it would be safe to land. Uh, obviously, these are just some of the suggestions that the crowd are uh, pushing forward. Um, maybe Benetta has a better idea herself. I mean, I'm you're... I'm really hoping that um, my brother will get this all sorted out from a magical standpoint. But if he doesn't, um, I think our best bet is probably going to be um, to try to lower ourselves down. Do you have? I'm assuming you have lots of rope here. Um, how how far off the ground are we currently? And are we going to be colliding sideways into the mountain or are we slowly descending? Okay, so the mountain range itself is the border between the human lands and the elf lands. Um, and you're on the elven side of that now. The descent is, as I kind of indicated, there's now sort of 10 degree change in, out in, in the islands balance so uh, it's descending at an angle now whereas before it was just sort of flying towards the mountains and would eventually have hit the top of the mountains um where exactly that's going to come out i'm not going to make a make you 
do a test for that. Um, it's going to probably be somewhere sort of midway um, up a large mountain um, and in amongst the crags and rocky peaks of the surrounding tops of mountains around it. Um, it could be you'll collide with the top and tumble. It could be that you'll run alongside a mountain and have chances to jump off. Um, but that's the kind of that's the kind of descent that's going on. So it's a it's not quite controlled, but it, it's not free falling. It's falling at an angle rather than just plummeting out of the sky. Um, and it still has some forward momentum driving it towards the, the mountains. Um, an educated guess. I mean, not that this isn't necessarily your area of education, um, but the the approach looks like you've got less than an hour before there's real danger that you're going to be hitting some something, an edifice, a, a rock face, a high cliff. Um, so again, that's the kind of situation you're putting yourself. Okay, so what I would hope to do is that people could potentially abseil down if we're too far off the ground um, and then kind of jump once they get to a reasonable height rather than trying to, you know, jump to, for example, a, a, a cliffside path right off the edge. It seems a bit safer. As, as you're chipping this into the group, um, there's... Yes. As you're chilling this into the group, there's a, a small voice sort of um, pipes in, and it's the young Pereka girl who um, has hardly left your side, to be fair. Uh, she's watching the chicken the whole time. Uh, and says, yeah, that's what I thought. Basically, I'll stand on the walls and watch. And when we get really, really, really close to the mountains, I can, like, I can whistle. And she whistles, wolf whistles very loudly. Like that. And everyone can come running, and then we'll just have loads of nets and ropes for people to climb down onto the rocks underneath. Is that what you're thinking? Yes, that's brilliant. I kind of look around to see what the reception is like, because I'm a bit iffy about putting a very, very small child in charge of this, but um, um, perhaps the, other people the... are willing. So if you want that to be the direction people are going, that's where we're going to do a test. Um, so you're going to convince people to volunteer for roles. This could be a bit of a sort of montage scene, maybe, of you know, you're, you're overseeing and joining in alongside people to try and inspire them to do things. Um, so I'll leave that in your head to start building that scene for description. But what we'll do is we'll put together a dice pool where you're inspiring that, where you're making that happen. Um, and I'll roll your um, test here to aim to beat. So I reckon that's not going to be too, it's not, not massive different. I'm going to put 2d8 into the pool and roll those. And I've got 14. So I keep saying it's not going to be that difficult. And then the next roll I make is the hardest difficulty I've set for you guys. But apart from that, um, uh, can you um, pull together a dice pool that you feel will um, inspire the masses? Not forgetting you have both the chicken and the trust of the crowd in your favor, should you feel the need to use them. Do I need to spend a plot point to use the trust of the crowd or do I just have it? No, so you now have that, you now have that. Okay. Now I think in, in the um, actual rules, effectively that um, asset only lasts a scene. Um, and this probably is technically a different scene now. Um, but I think we're gonna be, um, we're, we're playing for another hour. So I'm thinking of, of this as act one. I don't think we're gonna get to the point where everybody's off the island tonight. So we'll pick this up again, maybe in a, a future session when we need another one shot sometime. Um, so I'm letting the assets ride. The assets that you've got will last at least until the end of this session. Yeah. Okay. Um, and what does my distinction fickle luck do? Okay, so if your luck is fickle, um, that's probably one of the easiest distinctions to say it could work in either direction. Sometimes you're lucky, sometimes you're not. 
Um, so you get to decide because it's your distinction. You get the power of, of narration over it. Is this a moment where you are going to okay. be lucky, or is this a moment where it's going yeah, to? Yeah, I think I think I'll be lucky. lucky. That seems like a good idea. So you so put that down I'm as rolling... beneficial. Yeah. So I'm rolling devotion with a d6 because I have the crowd. Uh, so you should have a attribute trait, uh, attribute, attribute a value, and a distinction. So if you're doing devotion, let me pull up your character sheet for comparison. Um, your yeah, so, sorry, I'm, I'm using um, influence devotion. My your, distinctions are beneficial. Uh, and yeah, I, it may be strategy could come in here if you want that D6. Yeah, so that's 2D6 assets. Not, not 100% sure I've done that right. Um, yeah. Okay. So, um, because you've because you've added, I think you put two d six at the end, and the, the, this is part of my dice roll that needs some attention. So that's on me, not you. Um, it's added the two d six, and then added that as one of your highest rolls. So you've actually got a five and a six to get you eleven. Um, you haven't. You have two other fives in your dice pool if you want to pull those in as extra um, parts of your result, which would take your total to. If you pay one plot point and add one of those fives in, it takes your total to 16. Yeah, I'll do that. Okay. And then if you want to use that as, um, you then take um, narrative control and tell me sort of the montage of scenes that lead to people standing on the walls and watching for, for convenient points to jump down. Uh, your music cat. Sorry, um, I'm using my military training. As soon as I'm sure I've got their trust, I'm just going to start ordering them about like I've known them for years. Um, you over there on the ropes, um, make that fast. Um, you, you're, you're on lookout. You're going to be letting people know when they're going to go. Um, you make sure that the children are tied in properly. We don't want anyone falling out. Um, and uh, what else? Um, yeah, and I'm I'm very surprised at how well uh, Pereka is how how seriously she's taking her guard duty. So um, yeah, I'm yeah. I'm very pleased uh, with the, everyone. The, uh, the the general feeling is one of organized um, determination in the crowd everybody is working together towards a common goal the um the outcome of your role um is that you have uh, in your dice pool you have one of your dice that you didn't use roll the two the d8 and that d8 can be used as your asset that you're now gaining for this role um so you have preparations probably or um uh, you basically it's your it's yours to name but you have some asset in favor uh, and you create that at D8. Um, so how would you, I mean, like I say, I, I'd call it preparations, but this is your thing. What have you got going for you in this? Uh, yeah, preparations is good. Preparations. Okay, I'm adding that into your character sheet for you for reference. Okay, so um, Simon, you're led um, through the streets um, by Norsex. Um, towards the keep. The keep is his home. Um, uh, you uh, step into the grand building in the center of the city. And uh, his, um, the, the building itself is uh, edifice of austerity and history. Um, but he has a small uh, domicile within there that is quite homely. And, and calming and comfortable. He has a, uh, a dedicated area that's a library slash museum of the history of, of um, the Sky Elves. Um, he has a sort of sitting kitchenette kind of area. There's a, a glowing doorway uh, with a 
a shield over it, um, some sort of magical barrier that prevents you from descending into the cellars beneath, uh, descending into sort of the lower cellars beneath the, um, the keep itself. Um, and Did there are other rooms the off the primal side. well was in his home when he so I said, oh, you know, that's the most powerful artifact in my home. Um, it is... in, his, in his homeland, I believe he may have said, but yes, right. um, okay. he, he, he didn't go as far as saying it's here in my basement, but yes, right. he, he lives in the keep and somewhere within the bowels of that uh, would be a, a secret, secret chamber that uh, holds the primal well itself. He is the keeper of the well and as he's been walking along, he's been regaling you with some of the historic tales that the elders that have uh, maintained and kept the primal well safe generations um, how um, the self-sufficiency of his people is something that's a, a pride of many generations past um, the uh, the people have, have come to him as you've been walking along um, uh, crying out for help and saying what is, what is happening and he he's almost ignored them at um, at times as he's been laboring some of the stories that he's telling you um, and, and it, it, I, I feel with the way that you've played that, you know, you would be almost hesitant trying to pull his attention to the people as you're going past them. Yeah, it'd be, I'd be gritting my teeth and almost looking apologetically at his people. I mean, he's ignoring um, his people and um, it is building up some anger. I'm kind of glad that I have the anger stress, actually. Um, okay. And, yeah, so... He, he would notice that I haven't tarried behind. In fact, I'm almost one half step ahead of him, almost leading him forward. Um, when we get there, I'm going to re refuse the soup and just sit opposite him whilst he eats. Um, and, you know, very guarded body language. My arms are crossed. I'm staring at him pretty much nonstop. Um, you take a seat at his table. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. When he offers it, I'll sit. I'll sit at the table and I'll uh, I'll kind of look him in the eye. I'm not eating or drinking anything. Well, um, he doesn't know. He doesn't notice that you don't pick the drink up. He makes you, but he's busy in the kitchen area putting a, a bowl together, pouring in some soup. Um, uh, what is in the kitchen area? Is there anybody else to sway that's nearby? Um, he has no servants. It's a small area that he keeps for himself as a as a home. Did he um, come with a guard? Um, I, I am happy for you to have the guard that arrested you. Um, still escorting you. Um, if you had any of the other NPCs that had interacted with you, they would do that as well. So Necrix, the, the captain of the guard, is kind of standing over you in a almost... Um, he's attempting to be official and threatening and um, here's your captor, um, but he's not carrying any of that off. No. When um, Norsex goes inside the kitchen and starts potting around. I'm going to turn to the guard and say, when it gets to the point that this city hits the ground, I want you to know, when I leave, it won't be without a sense of defeat. And I'm going to mess with him. Um, basically just resolving myself to the fact that this elder is going to kill them all. Um, and just everything I've said is true um, but I'm, I'm messing with them and um, I'm going to get it so that the guard is going to start increasing in anxiety mm. okay so you want to <clears throat> you want to impress upon the guard that level of stress. Yeah. Um, now, this is not a major NPC. Um, they have lower stats um, and less stats. Um, Necrix is um, unlikely to take 
very much convincing. And he certainly is already anxious um, just in the role that he has to play. Um, he, his entire experience of being a god has been dealing with maybe the occasional drunk or rowdy youngster. Invading foreigners were never in his job description as far as he was concerned. Um, so his his heckles are up. That the that being the case, I don't think this is going to be a very difficult uh, test. To uh, I, I've said that every time, but this time I'm pretty confident that the, the target number will not uh, defeat you. So yeah, two uh, d six as a difficulty. Um, gets me a 10 feet to roll higher than. Now, um, I have stats for the um, the guard himself. I'm looking at one of them and thinking it's not going to help me as much as it's going to help you. Um, even your stressors, maybe the stress, maybe, actually, I'm going to roll the d6 on your insecurity. Um, and just add that in. Okay, that didn't make very much difference there. Um, but there is a D6 trait on Necrix, which is Pride. Um, so I would allow you to add that into your list. Um, and if you wish, you have a plot point. If you wish, you can spend a plot point to use your anger as a trait in your dice pool. But when you finish, it steps up your anger stress. No, I'm be I'm being shrewd. I'm not being angry. Okay. So, unfortunately, it's influence again, which is a D six. It says that he's a master interrogator, but he's not great at influence. Um, and um, the reason why I'm trying in this case is once again uh, either truth or justice. It doesn't matter which. Uh, I'll go with truth again. Um, they're D eights for both. Uh, do my distinctions matter? Yes. Um, so I've got straight to the point as one of my assets um, and it says spend a uh, point and either gain a D8 asset or step up an existing asset when undertaking a challenge because of your keen insight um, my insight is the guard is nervous um, whereas no six seems to be resolved almost um, so I would like to gain him as a D8 asset or at least my influence over him as a D8 asset. Um, simplicity is the best solution. Blah, 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 blah. Mm. I'm not entirely Actually, sure. your distinction working that way. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so uh, my specialities, uh, nope, neither of those two. And then, uh, so do I gain the D8 assets straight away? I'm sorry. Um, I this... need I'm using Sorry, straight, yes. straight to the. Let point. me check. Let me check the ruling on the character one last time, um, just to be sure. I think time's the killer in this okay. game, so I'm. Yeah, no, I think I th yeah, yeah. There's there's no delay on that. You spend a plot point, you get a D8 asset straight away, um, or step sure. up an existing asset. Yeah, no, I think this is right. So you you can see that one way of getting through this is to use the guard against Norsex to drive him towards taking better action. Yeah. Um, and you so said yeah, there you, was a stress that I could use as well. Uh, if you wanted, you could spend a plot point to add your own anger stress. Oh, no, sorry. Uh, you said there was something about the other character that I could use. Uh, oh, yeah, you D6 of pride on the, on the captain, yeah. Um, so um, um, when it says any other dice or assets, I just separate them by a comma. Uh, to be fair, yeah, I think that I think that should work. Um, if it doesn't, then we'll um, just roll. If if it doesn't work, then just roll them separately. Uh, okay, it uh, it did work. Um, it didn't work as well as I wanted it to, but it did definitely work. Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, okay. If I so let's let's take a look. At, let's take a look at that. Um, so we have a 10 as a target number you need to beat the difficulty set to 10. you have a nine and you have a plot point you've not used no you've just used I that just to used add it. The dice i'm just in. about to get rid of it yeah but but you have rolled a one so i can use that to give you stress and that gives you a plot point back which i will probably do because i think this is worth doing um, so here comes another plot point at you now simon 
yeah, the... I'd say my anger's about to go uh, back up. <laughs> yeah, I think... I think that will stick with the insecurity, I think. I will stick with the insecurity for now and work towards that with Babacar. So, yes, I mean, you've got your own mechanics that increase your um, anger. I'm going to pick on your insecurity and push that to D8. Um, your current dice result is a 9, but you have a plot point available and you have rolled a 3. Yep. Or even, the, or even the two, either of those would work. You can pay to bring your total up, and that would then give you... Um, it's important. I'm yeah. doing it. Yeah. Okay. Um, so you spent a plot point to create an asset. That asset was effectively some influence over the yep. guard. Um, that was a D8. Your effect dice is a D8. You can use that to now, therefore step up the asset of influence over the guard to a d10 I'll do um, that. and that is then high enough because none of his uh, traits are higher than a d10 mm -hmm. um, you effectively have that as an ally in your pc yep. um, he was a subordinate of norsix and that therefore counts as an interaction with norsix so we have two steps to do here at the end just before the break you had uh, given into Norsic, so he won a, uh, a conflict a contest, and so his catalyst dice went up, and the trait he was using, truth, went up. But you weren't available for me to then drop one of his other attributes, um, so one of his values is gone. So um, that's devotion, liberty, glory, mastery, or justice. I have to step down one. All right. Um, you pick. Yeah, let's have a look. Um... I'd like to bring down his mastery, actually. Okay, yeah. I've usurped him. Okay, so we'll draw that. So this is from the previous time. This one, you've kind of stolen something out from under him. So his catalyst dice goes down, back to an eight. Um, and one of his attributes goes down and one of them goes up and you choose both okay um i'm gonna say i'm gonna say his devotion goes up yeah well, that is what you're looking for you're trying to get him more invested in his people yeah uh i'm gonna put up his devotion uh for that reason um mm -hmm. i'm gonna bring down actually his liberty yeah, his own personal freedoms. Um, yeah, his own personal freedoms, and uh, that can also mean his selfishness, his ideals, uh, mm -hmm. any stupid yeah. bloody idea that comes from him that he is holding on to. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm going to go with that. Okay, so that puts him in a position now where his... Um, uh, that puts him in a position now where his, um, his footing is a little bit weaker. Uh, one of his main drives is still standing, um, we'll come to that. Um, but the guard is incensed by uh, Norsic's lack of action. Uh, he finds his pride insulted, uh, his pride in his people. And so he closes down on Norsic. As Norsic steps back into the kitchen for something, the guard follows him, leaving you unobserved for a moment by both parties um, and free to investigate the area a little more than you would have done under Norsic's watchful eye. Mm -hmm. So yeah, whilst uh, Norsex has been worked on by one of his guards, um, yeah, I'm gonna have a a quick look round uh, to see if there's any signs that set me on the path to finding the primal well. <clears throat> okay, so I'm gonna cut away from that, and we're gonna do a what also is going on kind of moment. Um, the um, the viewers at home watching the show see the feather shawl is at the base of the keep and has been circling around it looking for um, a building. He mutters to himself almost incessantly uh, about the um, poor state of the, of the town. Um, he finds an inn and boggles at who would be visiting this town, so it must just be for the locals. He, um, he locates a library. And whilst uh, he watches from it... Hey, thank you. Thank you. It's only the second time I've run this scenario. I really should have that by now. Uh, Feather Shaw uh, sees the library and uh, whilst 
conceiving that the contents of the library must be quite stilted um, for such a small settlement with uh, almost an insular um, society, the, um, they, they stay back. They watch as somebody leaves with bundles of books, clearly looking to rescue what history is contained in these volumes. And they use that opportunity to slip into the library. It's soon obvious that they're heading to the basement where um, the glow of their magic that, and yours that was ripped out of them still shows on one wall facing the bowels of the keep. And they start using their magic to peel the library bricks away, revealing behind them an ebony and dark brickwork of the keep. And they start to pull that away again with their magic. And you see the effects of the arcane magic breaking between the mortar and pulling the bricks apart. But also the viewer sees the magic being sucked in through the wall, through the cracks they're creating, and parts of their magic is being leached away. With that happening, we'll step away from there and come back to Babaka. As you're exploring the area, you see that um, magical archway that has that shield over it. Um, you kind of see the the uh, sky magic glow of, of sort of blue magic um, blocking you from passing through that door into the darkness beyond. There are steps leading downwards. Um, there was the library museum area, which uh, your attention is kind of drawn to, but you want to make sure anything else? Um, if I don't see anything else that draws me to it, I'm kind of just sizing up the shield, wondering if I can take it. Um, it's been designed to prevent most from entering. Um, I think... I see no reason that your magic couldn't give it a try. It would be a difficult challenge. That said, how long you've got before they come through and see you trying to rip apart the very defenses of the um, generations long history, I'm not sure. But Is that the path you're going? It, 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 he's looking at it and he's so tempted just to put together the mother of all firebolts and blow that thing sky high and just start running down there. Um, you know, and, and is this it, the it, simplest of solutions, though? Yeah, it, it, and it is the simplest of solutions. Yeah, you, yeah, you read the character sheet too. Um, <laughs> uh, I picked a very straightforward person. Um, thing is, I've got really good dice pulls for this. <laughs> that's the thing that's killing me. Um, and I have got my guard as a distractor. Uh, I should imagine the the voices are raised. If ever I'm going to try and break this thing and just get cracking, now would be the time. Um, the phrase isn't, it's a one shot, I'm going to do it. The phrase is, this is my character, I'm going to do it. <laughs> okay. so, I didn't um... pick a thing, well, I, I, I picked a thinker just... He doesn't think in the right direction sometimes. Uh, yeah, I'm okay. going to conjure the mother of all firebolts, try to break the shield and bolt. <laughs> this is a very difficult test. Um, let me have a look. So it's going to be against, effectively against Norsex. Mm -hmm. The... Um, Maintenance of this shield has been upon him for most of his life. Um, so I will be taking now. Uh, well, thankfully, his catalyst is back at eight, so that will simplify my die floor. Um, so he is effectively defending the well. Yeah, his work is, yeah. Uh, his. Um, Devotion. I feel it's devotion. It's his devotion to his legacy yeah. um, that he's calling on here. He's not seeking glory. That's not his character. He is, he is committed. Yeah. Um, he has a beneficial distinction. He is the keeper of the primal well. 
he has sky magic. That was what he was using to raise the shield. Um, and he has an asset. He has a necklace around his neck, which is a warning device if anybody is attempting to go after the if anybody is breaking through the shield. So that's that's fine. Two. Yes. I wasn't exactly going to do this quietly. I just needed the chance to do it. <laughs> um, I am going to spend my remaining plot point. Oh, uh, there was also hmm, your insecurity, I think. You're feeling nervous about doing this, yeah. so I'm going to add he's, in. He's a, got a D8 on that, yeah. So that as well, so that's a further five. It's not going to change much there. Um, I will spend that plot point I've just done to bring the six and add that in to make my target 20. I don't want this to be difficult for you, but I want to point this out. I did roll a one. You have no plot points available, but had had you had a plot point left, you'd spend it now to, um, uh, to reduce the stress. All right, so... That shield is very well defended as a target number of 20. Uh, this is just a straight test. It's not a, um, it's not a back and forth. It's whether or not you feel that you can take that. So it's, it's just try. Yeah. Um, oh yeah. Um, so he stands in front of it, heft his half, uh, the heft of his, um, stuff in his hand and goes sorry sister places it uh, places it in, like taking a, a warm age stance um, and he's going for it um, so I'm going to uh, go with uh, what was it uh, uh, what was it break the shield is what I'm doing um I'm achieving it with my intellect. Going full caster. Why am I trying? Mm -hmm. Glory, baby. Uh, do my distinctions matter? Uh, yeah, they do. Yes. <laughs> you, have, you have a sun mage distinction. So I'm, that's, I'm, that's play, I'm playing <laughs> straight into the brash caster. Uh, do my specialities apply? Oh, yes, they do. Yes, they Cern do. Sun magic. And uh, then do I have any assets? Yes, I do. Fulman Ignum. The bolt of fire, um, and he he's cranking this up as hard and as fast as he can. Uh, probably not white hot, probably around blue hot at this point, and spiraling um, to the point where you know it, it it's this corkscrewing bolt of blue fire. Um, so I'm going to throw that D8 in there as well. I don't think I can use my guard asset, even though he's running interference for me. Um, so... No, no. I think I think you should consider that. Sorry. Okay. Okay. The idea is that it's, you, you're he's not just me the opportunity success, in the first place. Testing. But if he's still an yeah. asset, he's an asset. Let's do this. Uh, one so... of the one of the negative outcomes could be. So yeah. Yep. Uh, so let's go. Right. So I've got eighteen on the dice. Um. Now. It's a good try. You. Uh, I think I'm out of options. I don't because uh, I there was something yeah, about I'm taking no stress. Plot points. Um, yeah. So no. So uh, if you fail the test, you'll take stress. If you'd rolled a one, I could pay you a plot point to give you stress. Right. Um, okay. You have not rolled any ones, um, uh, so I, yeah. I'm not activating it. It's unfortunate, um, but yeah, that's what it is. Yeah. So you. Um, there, there, are, there are a number of ways that this can go, and the narrative is in your hands. When you know um, you failed, but how have you failed? Is it that you just didn't go through with it because you looked at it, you sized it up, and you thought this isn't going to work? Is it they walk in? Is it that you tried and then they saw you doing it? What's going on here, sir? Um, I hit it. <laughs> he wouldn't have backed down. Okay. I hit it. Uh, I just. I, I think it was probably more a lack of finesse, rather than anything else. It's that insecurity kicking in, yeah. Um, mm -hmm. There's a, there's a lack of finesse 
in what he did. It was raw power. He was focusing more on the stability of containing all that raw arcane power into the firebolt and not the correct application of it. You know, um, it's like it's all energy, no piercing method. And when it hit, it it's loud. It's, uh, you know, shook the damn walls. Um, but it didn't get through. Mm. Um, the chimes going off in the um, kitchen area caused Norsex to rush out almost before the actual blast strikes the walls um, of the of the gateway itself. He sees what you're doing and curses you as a fool. Um, the, the wards on that doorway have stood for generations. You damn fire mage, you, there, there was no way a paltry spell such as yours could have broken through there. Uh, and if you had, what was your plan? What did you think you could do? Find the one artifact that will save your people. And also preserve that's not, it. That's not how this should be done. Come with me. Um, he turns and I, um, rebukes, he turns and rebukes yeah. Necrix and tells him to stay and leads you into the, into the library. Um, I acted out of pride and now I'm humiliated. Um, and so with heavy footsteps um, and, a, and an iron jaw, I'm following after him, but I can't hide the blushing of someone who's made a fool of himself. Um, Norsex is um, uh, having just won that uh, test. His devotion and his catalyst dice have both gone up now to 10. Um, your previous intent was for his liberty to drop, so I'm going to continue with that, meaning his liberty and glory are now both at four. Um, so he is now putting aside his freedoms and will pursue effectively what you want, which is an outcome for his city. Um, his dithering drops away. He finds a force within himself to um, commit. He leads you into the... Um, he leads you into the library. There's a weight on him still. Um, his steps don't falter, but you can sense that um, what he's about to do does pain him. He uh, reaches out to a gargoyle on the wall, flicks the um, tongue of the gargoyle, and in the proper Scooby-Doo fashion, it's painted a slightly different shade of, from everything else in the, in the scene. The bookcase swivels and opens to another door, another archway, and another set of descending steps. Um, and he asks for you to um, step through there um, and takes a sconce from the wall, uh, lights it and follows you. With almost a sulk, he does. Uh, Norsex uh, guides Babacar down a, a spiral staircase into a, um, it's only a short walk, but you enter a small um, chamber. Uh, there's a chill in the air. Uh, and although you're convinced you're completely sealed in from the outside, there's a sense of uh, a wind passing through the area. In the center stands a simple crossbar on which hangs a cuirace, um, intricate and slightly glowing with blue magic. Um, the light from the, the torch carried by Norsex and this combined barely illuminate the small chamber but you sense that there are other figures around the edges. It's only as you've stepped off the last step and Norsex steps down beside you that the light is sufficient. You see the uh, other sky wing elves that are now surrounding you. And you make out that each individual one of them is frozen in place, grotesquely disfigured and encased in some strange dark crystal. What the hell and now is we cut this? to cat. And now we cut to cat. Yep. So outside the um, the preparations of oh if we complete lost cat. I'm sorry, can we just check to see if she's still on? Uh, no, cat's still on you. Yeah. Okay, cool. Okay, lost you on the roll twenty, I just panicked for a second. Um, the uh, crowds are well prepared. 
Um, the approaching mountains are not rushing towards you, but it's certainly getting uncomfortable out there. Um, the people that are not required for immediate action are safely ensconced inside structures that feel the most secure. Um, should there be a collision, you want them to be somewhere where they have cover. Everybody is ready. Um, Pereka and the elder um, grown-ups that are um, on watch uh, look out for opportunities. Um, there's a series of signals that have been set up ready for them the crowds to know this is the time gather we are we are lowering ourselves um binoculars or telescopes are being used to to scout far in the distance to see where the, the best moment will appear and present itself um and this is that moment um now we're looking to finish it this could be um, a good opportunity for us to throw in the third of the uh, playtest mechanics that needed to be looked at We've done tests and we've done um, contests. This is a challenge. So it's where there's a dice pool for you to overcome. Um, these dice need to be targeted and, and eliminated one at a time. The suggested difficulty for this is that I give you 4d8 and then you've got to wipe them out. But it's for a larger team. So it's assumed that you and a number of other players, you and a number of other players would have um, what turns against them. So I'm going to halve that because it's such a small group and you're on your own. So, um, just with. quickly, Mike, uh, when you're taking these dice out, do you have to take them eight, six, four? Um, so it depends on how your results are. If you roll an eight or lower, then yes, you will end up just stepping them down. Right. Okay. If you can beat the eight, then a dice that's higher than an eight will wipe out an entire dice in one uh, test. So it's a series of, uh, of tests on this dice pool. Um, so there are only going to be two D8s to roll against. Um, but what I will do is, well, you know, in fact, we'll just stick with that. Um, so I'm going to just do a... Um, so the first difficulty that you're rolling against will be these two D8s, and it's an 8. Um, so you will produce a dice pool and suggest what action you're going to be taking at to overcome that... Um, general threat. And the threat here is the actual evacuation of the Nian. So large numbers of people. It's the difficulty of people climbing down, uh, stuck between a city and a mountain face. It's the distance that you could end up falling from that, that um, city to the ground below. It's all of these factors and anything else you can imagine as well. So the actions that you and this group of people are taking to overcome those. Could you suggest how you're going to take action to ease this or succeed at evacuating people. Uh, it's still muted. There might be muting going on. Kat, you Sorry. Will? Yeah. That's okay. Um, I, I had to guess there for a second. Yeah, I'm um, going to look around at the people around me and kind of try and build up a sense of teamwork between everyone. Um, you know, I can see they're all already working together quite well, but at the moment they're treating me as the authority and if they're going to work together properly, they need to be ready to accept whatever anyone says goes. Um, yeah, okay. You, you need some lieutenants. Exactly, yeah. But, you know, I see where you're if, if anyone says, hey, we're about to crash, I need everyone to take that seriously, no matter if it's, like, a kid or anyone. Um, so I'm going to use spirit for that, or sure. do you think that's influence? Um, I, I think spirit is more your own internal strength. Influence is bringing other people on board with that. Okay, I'm, I'll go for influence then. Um, and can I do mastery, or is that just for swords? Um, Uh, your mastery is generally your strength at skills in general. So, um, yeah. So mastery, um, my distinctions, I'm going to say that my distinctions aren't affecting me. Um, um, and then... I would, 
I would happily say that you can use um, you're a knight, so you have structural, you know, hierarchical experience. So your distinctions are your first one is just generally your race or your culture's approach to things. If all else fails, the way that you would approach things as a Sunfire Elf would be your fallback. Um, the the other two are more specific, I guess. Um, okay, so you right. can still use a benefit, but if you wanted to use it as a hinder, um, then you still get a plot point benefit as well, because you guys are very low on plot points. Okay. Um, sure. Course, I'll, your, I'll... Fickle, your fickle look can be applied almost either direction in any role. Yeah. Um, so I'm, I'm going to say my being a knight is beneficial then. Sure. Um, and then, sorry, I'm just looking at my specialties. What are my specialties? Animal training. Oh, I've got strategy. Um, so I'll Seems use right. that. Um, and then I've also got the crowd's trust and preparations. So that's yeah. another D6 and a D8, or can you only use one at a time? You can use as many as apply. So the D6 and the D8. Um, and as Simon's pointed out, you want to put one D6, comma, one D8. Okay. Is that right, Sai? Yep. Did that work? That's before? how it worked for me, yeah. Well, anyway, if not, we can figure it out from what's on screen. So. Oh, okay. wow. Okay. Those aren't great numbers, but it's still doable. Um, for, well, you've rolled a nine for a start, actually. So we, I, the target was eight. You've rolled a nine. Um, the one, uh, you're f I'm going to give you a plot point and buy that and give you uh, some insecurity stress because you're looking at the panel thinking, this is risky. Uh, but you still get the, uh, you've got an effect dice that is an eight. So that steps down one of those two dice to a six. So I'm doing all that book work. So my pool here is an eight and a six, and you're gonna get stress. And that's gonna be seven, six, no. Insecure stress D6. Okay. Um, so I will now be rolling the eight and the six and your insecurity. So it's D8 and two D6. And I get an 11 out of that. Uh, so you, your success, uh, sorry, I should have given you some narrative control there. I'm moving things along too quickly. Your success uh, had an effect and people are looking to each other, counting on each other in a, a community. There are a couple of people stepping up as um, sort of leaders of small teams, um, project leaders as such, um, and it's having an effect. People feeling those preparations are in the right places and they are going to the right places when they're needed. Um, there's still the opportunity for somebody to spot that moment when it's safe to come down um, or to um, have the preparations in specific locations to uh, spread out at the right moment. There are different ways that you can go Sorry, forward. Sorry, my internet's um, breaking up a bit. Could you uh, say that again? This. Basically, I'm asking you to take another action against the pool. Um, yeah. And I was just trying to lay some groundwork, but you're, you're creative and uh, a good role player. You'll figure something out. Um, so the target number is an 11. Mike, did you say that we're still at uh, 2d8s at the moment? Yeah. Okay. Um, so we've got our preparations. We've got everyone working together. Um, I think right now we just need to build confidence. I know I don't have it, but fake it till you make it, right? Mike, are we still at 2d8, by the way? Uh, it's a d8 and a d6. d8 and a d6. I will switch that over. I quickly cobbled together some uh, some dice. Ah, nicely done, sir. Nicely done. Uh, so um, I'll just switch that over now. So if you look on roll 20, there's a couple of dice icons now beneath the player character icons. Yeah. 
In fact, we're not using some of these. I'm kind of grabbing some of those from my character sheet. So, do that. Yeah. But there we go. So, um, I'm going to use spirit um, to try and like convince them that I'm not afraid and they shouldn't be afraid either. Um, mm -hmm. And my distinctions, I'm going to take fickle luck as a hindrance. Um, okay, get you that plot point. And you get the plot point when you choose to roll it, so that's available to you. My specialties do not apply, and then um, I've got the trust of the crowd, I've got preparations. So 1d6 and 1d8. Yeah. Okay, so that's good. Um, the target was 11. Um, you've got a, a 15. You have rolled two more ones, which is not the best, but your effect dice is a 10. And that 10 will get rid of one of the d8s straight out. So we're going to do that right now. So we're now on a d6 for this um, dice pool. Um, but I'll pay you another plot point. And activate the opportunities, the hitches that you've given me. Um, and I'm going to step your insecurity up um two more times and i'll take you to a d10 insecure when a stress is taken to d12 you are stressed out um, and can no longer act in the in the turn um, it would effectively mean that if there are any dice left in the pool then the efforts have failed Either uh, something catastrophic happens, or just general failure, and something else happens. I have something in mind. Um, not that I'm saying I have plans, but what I've done here is, um, when you're doing a challenge, uh, it's uh, meant to be a narrative initiative. So each person acts and then chooses the next person to act. Once everybody has acted, the pool itself gets an action. Now, because you're on your own, it would be very stacked against you if you did something and then I did something. Because every time the pool acts, it has two options. Either step up its pool by adding another dice, basically undoing everything you've just achieved, or it attacks you and does more stress to you. So I've given you two rounds to get stuff done. I've now only got a D6 to roll against you, plus the um, insecurity dice, of, which is now a 10. So I'm going to be rolling a D10 and a D6 against what you set up as the difficulty. And I'm going to try and use it to make you spot some fault in the plan. So you're, you have to use all those preparations, all of your assurance, all of your inner spirit, or whatever dice pool you want, to make sure you've covered all the bases. And then I'm going to roll against the difficulty you set to see whether or not there was a hole in your plan all along. Because if I can get that stress on you, if I can step you up, to D12 stress, that means that there was something wrong with the plan. Okay, so I'm going to take um the fact that I'm a knight as being beneficial. Um, specialties, I'm going to say strategy. Um, and then trust of the crowd and preparations. Okay. More that's ones. good. That's, that's a good one. But yes, there is another one. Um, I mean, as it stands, I could activate that now and, and stress you out. I will hold off on that and let's see how the role goes. Okay, if the role does it, I think that's more narrative. So I will, um, I'll give the dice roll first. I don't. So have what to you're saying is every, I'm done for either way. I don't have to activate every hitch, and I'm going to opt not to do this. I'm going to leave it entirely to the dice because I, 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 this close to us finishing, I think the dice should decide. Okay. Um, so I'm going to roll to try and beat a 13 
which is going to be pretty difficult. But um, every time I've predicted something like this, it's gone in my favor. Um, so the dice pool here is the D6 and the D10. So it's really going to have to be some top level results. Okay, there it goes. 11, thankfully we escaped. Okay, you sewed up all of the loose ends. So it's back to you to bring this home now, knock out that D6. Um, um, I would I would say that you've got a good chance. I mean, you've got three plot points, so um, I'm gonna roll the D6 and the D10 again, so it's effectively the same same dice roll there. Um, um, so have I succeeded at a contest with a foe? Um, I'm thinking not, because of, okay. like, a foe specifically is if like you're in a contest against somebody, a fight, or a, um, or even just an argument or a dispute. This is you against mm -hmm. nature, um, okay. not against um, somebody else. Um, so, oh, there you are, you see. Your target to beat is two, and that's what happens when you knock down a, a challenge pool to one dice. Um, and there is a one on there, so you can activate that one to step down one of your stresses. Um, so pay a plot point just to do that. But we can wait until you've done your dice roll first. Okay. Um, so. So again, this is you describing an action to bring this home. So I think this is the point where everybody's going to try and actually do the evacuation. Right. Okay. Um... So I'm going to just be like physically helping people down. Um, so I'm going to make, and um, can can I take it as justice or or would it be mastery? Um, Cause I'm, I'm, I'm saving this, these people because yeah. you know, it's the right and yeah. just thing to do. Um, just but the actual right. skill is. Right. Yeah. Sorry? The motivation. So the virtue is the motivation behind everything. Okay, right. So yes, you're motivated by the justice of rescuing innocent people and yeah. seeing to it that they make it safe for them. Yeah. Okay. Um, I'm going to say um, my distinctions do not matter. My specialties of strategy, I would say yes. And then preparations, 1d8. Um, and then instead of trust of the crowd, just for flavor, um, I'm going to use Wiggy instead, Wiggy the chicken, um, because I, I, I didn't notice. I was about to leave somebody behind and the chicken flew off my shoulder and squawked at me to tell me that there was one last person left. I like it. Oh yeah, I mean, you blew that out of the water. Um, so uh, I think this is actually the first time we've seen this, but um, uh, so um, discard one of your plot points and buy off the stress because we've not needed them to add anything into your, your total. Yeah, how many um, times can I do that? that, that uh, I only rolled the one, so you, can only, you, okay. you spend it once to activate the opportunity I rolled, and then for each one I rolled, you can step your um, stress down by one. So I, I'll do that. I've got the controls for that here. Um, so that's now a D8, um, which is kind of important because the one that you've rolled would be used to then step it back up, but I don't want to punish you, so we'll, we'll close that down in a minute. Um, I think this is the first time that... Uh, a heroic success has happened, so I'll just introduce that concept as well now. Um, if you roll five or higher than the um, target number, you get a heroic success for every step above by five, so five, 10, 15. Um, so you've got two heroic successes there. It's not gonna be too important, but we'll, we'll come to that. Um, your effect dice is a D8. For each heroic success, you can automatically step your effect dice up by one. Again, not too important because you're only hitting a d6, so it was already enough. Um, but that effectively turns that from a d8 to a d10 to a d12. And d12 effect would have just wiped out virtually anything in this game. The, therefore, 
uh, you have successfully managed to get a massive evacuation organized under your uh, um, managerial nightly skills. Um, indeed, Wiggy was instrumental in rescuing the last uh, infant from, from uh, some um, corner of a building. And everybody's climbing down those uh, nets and leaping from them onto a, a, a mountain pass. Um, so some almost frozen um, cliff top, uh, but at least they're not now plumbing into the, the doom of the uh, town itself. Um, and it was well timed. The island, uh, as the as the last foot steps off of those ropes. And you see everybody safely deposited on the um, cliff shelf. The uh, the island passes within meters, closing further against that cliff. Um, you see, uh, for a brief moment, the fraying of the ropes of the nets uh, beneath you as the mountain just slices through. And then the grind as the two rocks meet, the island twists and turns with the friction rocking everybody in the library the shelves fall around further shore um, as you're facing the um, the rock bound dead bodies of skywing elves babakar you're you're thrown to the ground the torch spinning on the ground and spluttering out uh norsex falls upon you um the skywing elves stood on the um, cliff look up at the town as it starts to spiral out of control at your face looking down at them um, some falling with the collision as the mountain itself is shaken um, and the island continues into the rocks around it um, shaking everybody in their place and um, we will be closing tonight's session with that moment you've saved the mass of occupants but you are now trapped on a crashing island as rocks around you are falling apart and the buildings are being splintered and there are dead bodies in the basement. And Feather Shawl is inches from breaking through that last wall. Thank you very much, everybody. That was Act One of The Lost Oasis. Amazing. Oh, brilliant. Thank you, Mike. <laughs> Thank you again, guys. Um, um, and thank you for guiding us through uh, Cortex as well. Um, I know that we we didn't, because we set this up on the fly, we didn't um, uh, put together huge overlays and things like that. That's something that we can do in future. I know that this is Mike's system. So I have a feeling system that if I, if I was to... It's, it's not my own system. But it's, it's, it's system my system of choice, yeah. Um, I, I've I've given up on uh, NWOD 2004 for Genesis now. Genesis is my system. Um, yeah, yeah. And um, so um, I know that we're going to be seeing more Cortex Prime in future. Anybody who hasn't used it, uh, we are deviating a little bit further away from D&D &D by various degrees now and seeing a lot more uh, systems coming in, as it should be. D&D &D is not the only system, but you know we, we do still have our, our long-running game, and we'll be going back to Illyria um, uh, for, uh, for many years to come. Um, but it's great to see another system in here, and it's great to see that you guide us along with that. I have to say, something that the guys didn't see watching the stream is that Roll20 actually has um, just kind of uh, an app that says, does this apply? Does that apply? What are you doing? And it builds the dice pool for you. Um, so uh, certainly I'd say, Mike, if uh, if that's a particular plugin for Roll20, um, if you could share that in the Discord, that would be fantastic. So that's my own personal build on Roll20. You built it. Um, yeah, I built it. And I'm, I've, I've just this week put it in for adding to the Roll20 um, character sheet uh, repository. Yeah. So... Um, it's specifically built for this playtest. Um, you could tweak it to make some of your own characters, but there are limitations to what you'd get away with with that. Um, and obviously, I'm waiting for it to actually go through approval. So don't expect to see it just yet. But that will be listed as the Cortex Prime um, Tales of Zadia playtest character sheet when it does go live. Uh, I'm hoping I'm hoping it should go through on this round 
but the chances of that the first time I've applied it, uh, <laughs> they'll probably find something and come back. Um, so within a week or so, and I've been in discussion with the staff at um, at uh, Fandom who own Cortex uh, and had full permission from them to actually share this. So it's um, I, I'm really hopeful. I'm really hopeful that this will actually be live soon. Um, yeah, I have. So soon. I, have, I mean, that's yeah. that's amazing. Yeah. So that's the carry sheet and the dice pool builder. I've got other tools in the back end from my GMing side that I put together using the API. So I've grabbed some API code that other people have built yeah. that helps me to keep track of stress. Mm -hmm. But yeah, all of that, uh, all of the carry sheet and the um, and the dice pool builder are going to be available shortly. Can't, tell, can't say when, but hopefully so. Sure. So um, I'm actually just showing the uh, the roll twenty screen now. By the way. And, and cool. uh, unfortunately, I can't interact with the one that's on there. Well, I, I, can, I kind of can, but uh, I wonder if I can show a character sheet just briefly. I don't want to spend too much time on this because uh, we have reached our, our end time. I appreciate and, you. And uh, we've got... Uh, I appreciate you, sure. Um, but yeah, so uh, you can see here, um, uh, Mike's put these in. All of these can change. You can see where Mike added in the stress for angry and insecure. You've got the <laughs> values here. And this is one thing that does draw me to Cortex Prime. I wouldn't want to run it, I'll confess. Uh, not that there's anything wrong with it. It's just sometimes a DM just doesn't gel with the system but loves to play it. Um, and the thing I really love is this thing here, privately I'm preoccupied with my greater purpose. Sometimes I get lost in my work and forget myself. It really drives the character decisions, which is why you saw me making some decisions that probably didn't fire as many brain cells as Simon normally likes to fire in his characters. Um, and uh, then the assets and special specialities. And this is what we were talking about here, um, that everything is resized itself weirdly through OBS but it looks a lot better on um, on uh, Chrome and you go into here and it says what are you trying to achieve how are you achieving this um, so oh yeah it's glitching out with that but uh, how are you achieving this uh, why are you trying how do your distinctions matter do your specialities apply and then anything else which is where of course you put your checking dice into which is a fundamental part of any role-playing system um so uh yeah you put all of that in and then it rolls it you can hear the, the whoop um so that's fantastic the other thing as well is this is completely supported by the guys who make dragon prints i think i'm writing saying is it mike uh, so the the guys that um, make Dra the, yeah Wonderstorm, the company that produced Dragon Prince for Netflix, um, are 100 percent behind the role playing game. They're they're trying to tie some of the content in, um, so that uh, season four may even make reference to some of the scenarios and, and uh, content from the role playing oh. game. So, if yeah, they managed to be... put the canon across like that, that would be wonderful. Uh, the reason why I'm saying that is I've just dragged uh, my character. Sorry for the bad framing of the characters that it gave us. I, I did it within a minute. Um, <laughs> and uh, so these are the characters, the, all of the player, uh, playable characters that are available. Um, and you can see uh, they've got the playtest and pre-order. Um, you can see the beautiful art that they put forward as well. So this isn't just something that somebody put together in the back burner. This is something that's had full investment. Um, I've only just started watching Dragon Prince, but I love it, um, and um, it's high fantasy in a way that really I, I hunger for sometimes as well. Um, but anyway, I thought I'd prompt that and just show the visuals on there. Um, I'd like to leave the last word to you, Mike, and to say goodbye. Sure. Thank you. Thank you for that. Could I, could I ask a favor? Could we just show the um, Roll20 screen one more time just to make sure that the two uh, Catalyst characters are on screen just uh, for yeah, play, sure, play test feedback? Uh, just to make sure that they're visible. Yep, the two Catalyst characters are there. Let me just jump into it. Sure. Because um, I need to get rid of the character sheet. Yeah, of course. So, Thanks. Uh, yeah, if I if I pop this off here, you can see uh, both uh, Feathershaw there and Norsix. And um, for the viewers, these two characters here that we were interacting with throughout the adventure, these dice uh, that you can see around their portraits change throughout the adventure. So if you're playing this in Roll20, you'll watch as uh, maybe Feathershawl, if you were pro them or against them, would be getting stronger or weaker, and the same with Norsex. So yeah, those are um, editable dice. Um, so each one of those dice is just a um, multi-sided um, token uh, that I've loaded up from a uh, table I created. So that's not included in the character sheet itself. Um, but they are that's something that you could set up yourselves to drop the assets in. Um, what I wanted to say then, so thank you for that. I've, I've just 
for the uh, sake of the stream, I've uh, shared the link for the URL, the URL for the role-playing game, um, so you can download the um, playtest rules and the scenario. Uh, um, I might uh, to, hang the... on. Can I just get you to do that a sec, uh, uh, again in just a sec? Um, okay. Because you're not a mod, uh, so. I... <laughs> yeah, of course. <laughs> yeah, no, that's uh, right. right. Hang on, what, uh, one second, and do it again. <laughs> There we go. Okay, so <laughs> I've now added the URL for the uh, for the downloadable PDFs of the character sheets, the um, the court rules, uh, so playtest rules and playtest scenario. Um, all of that's available there for you um, to download, and I've left that in the conversation so anybody watching this on VOD later can get that as well. Um, I'm really pleased to have been able to run this again. I ran it on Friday with Corinne and a few others. Uh, it was a great fun then, uh, a larger group. So I had more spotlight time to, to share between people and I had uh, more people to explain the rules to. So it was a little bit easier tonight, I'd say. Um, and just as much fun both times. But yeah, I had a little easier time getting the rules across to you too. And uh, um, I also focused on trying to fit just the first act into today's session. On Friday, I tried to run the whole thing. Um, the chicken took up way too much time. was the number one piece of feedback as I got. Should. As it should. <laughs> Uh, is or so, yeah, is not the chicken the most important part of this plot? I mean, why are we... Like, yeah, if, the, yeah. if the writers yeah, didn't intend for this to happen, they shouldn't have put the chicken Don't in. Don't put a chicken in, in chicken called Wiggy. Yeah, I'm sorry. You know, um... <laughs> um, so I hope that we can pick up um, Act 2 in the future. Um, no specific plans as of yet, but we'll, uh, we'll see what we can fill out it. Um, yep. Thanks and again, I'll everybody. Um, decent, uh, I'll put together a decent uh, <laughs> set of frames next time. <laughs> I think we did really well. So thank you for throwing it together in short notice. So um, my usual sign off is please be kind to others and rewind this video so they can watch it in comfort. And we'll move on from there. All the best, guys. <laughs> thank you very much, everybody. And uh, if you enjoyed our particular brand of madness, I'm mostly looking at Stefan, if you're still here. Uh, please take a look in our channel notes below. Uh, there's a Discord link. Please join the chaos. Uh, say hi. We talk about various games. Uh, as you can see from the collection we have here and you seen, uh, may see in our VODs, uh, some of our other chaotics, um, you can come along and help. We are going to uh, help, no, join the fun. Um, we are going to raid. We've only got a few people, but we're going to raid very, very quickly um, and, uh, and say goodnight. So I'll just quickly grab a... Uh, a random raider. It will probably be one of our chaotics. Probably going to be Kate. Um, or yep, yeah, it's going to be Kate. Let's go raid Kate. Um, thank you very much. Oh, and thank you Third Floor Wars for uh, joining us. Um, I know you came uh, probably for um, Blades in the Dark. Thank you for uh, sticking around anyway. Blades in the Dark will be back next uh, Tuesday, where Rodrigo will be back in the DM chair. But until then, we're going to raid our fellow chaotic uh, Kate Madison. So please give the love when we go there. Until then, good night. <laughs>